This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past. The only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming my second um, Sam Kinison outlaw. And I am talking about Joey Gaynor. Um, I talked to Carl LeBeau a couple years ago. You know, Carl unfortunately passed um, not too long ago. And um, I'm going to have Joey on the show today. Um, he's one of the comedy store legends, and, um, you know, he's had a great career. Um, he was in Comedy's Dirtiest Dozen concert film among Bill Hicks, Tim Allen, Stephanie Hodge, Steve Pearl, and several others. Um, he was on Jonathan Winter's On the Ledge Showtime special. He was uh, recurring on the last season of First and Ten. He was in the Christmas classic All I Want for Christmas. Um, he's had a great career, and we're going to talk about all that stuff today. And I'd like to say rest in peace. Well, I don't want to say it, but it's really sad. Um, rest in peace, Ned Beatty, one of the greatest actors, man who's in so many fucking great movies, Deliverance, Squeal Like a Pig, Silver Streak, Superman, The Toy, Network, Nashville, so many great movies. He was one of the greats and very underrated. Rest in peace, Ned Beatty. So yeah, here is my interview with Joey Gaynor. Hello. Good afternoon, Joey. Welcome to the show, sir. Oh, how are you doing, Tommy? How are you? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Actually, pretty good, pretty good. It's a nice day here in uh, Southern California, getting hot, but uh, I'm all right. I'm in the, uh, I'm in the shade, <laughs> so to speak. Awesome. So, uh, so what's happening, my friend? Oh, nothing much. Uh, this is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, no problem. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, and, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, going back in time, were you a funny kid growing up? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I always, uh, yeah, I mean, we all have tragedy and things just get funny. I guess, and uh, my dad passed away when I was eight, so I started looking at the world through a different lens, and uh, yeah, yeah, I would think I was kind of funny when I was a kid. I was always uh, uh, clowning around and kidding around and stuff. I was really musical, too. I always wanted to be like a, I always wanted to be a, uh, uh, well, the Danny Thomas show growing up, I would watch that, and I wanted to be an entertainer like that. I wanted to work at night, so I wouldn't have to get up. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's the truth. So um, yeah, I would you know imitate the guys I saw on television, and uh, I would watch Ed Sullivan and imitate the comedians and stuff like that. Yeah, that was one of my my favorite things to do when I was a kid, definitely. Yeah. Besides Danny Thomas, who else influenced you? Um, when I was a little kid, well, Abbott yeah. Costello and Three Stooges, the whole gamut. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, as a kid, um, the comedians I liked as a kid were Alan King and, uh, oh wow, uh, the guys that would, well, it, it, as I got older, you know, the, the guys that began to influence me more were like Robert Klein, um, mm. George Carlin, guys like that, but Richard Pryor, I would say, was that from the time I was about 10 years old, Richard Pryor was the guy that when I first saw him in like 65 or uh, 1965 or, uh, yeah, on the Merv Griffin show, I would say that Richard Pryor was was the biggest influence on uh, on uh, stand-up for me. Oh, yeah. To, or to be funny, yeah, yeah, I always thought Richard was the greatest. I still do, I think he was the greatest. Yes, he and, was. Uh, and, and then, you know, I got to to know him and open for him and work with him and everything was great so it's a dream come true it's, uh, wow did, did he give you any advice yeah put the funny in something people don't remember anymore <laughs> uh, I asked him one time I said well, what is it what's the secret you know, there ain't no secret just put the funny in <laughs> you, know, you know people go up there they want to do all this uh, they want to do um, uh, they, they, you know they want to they want to make dissertations. They want, but they 
don't put anything funny in it. And they wonder why it lays there. And it's, and it's true. You can say almost anything if you put funny in it. Yeah. If funny isn't in it, it's, it, then it's, it's, it ain't funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's the best way to put it, man. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that is the best way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, where are you from originally? Newark, New Jersey. So you came from New Jersey. Did you did you go mm-hmm. to did you go to college after high school? Uh, I went to one semester of Rio Hondo Junior College, Harvard on the Hill in Whittier, mm-hmm. and uh, I was doing stand up by then. I started doing stand up kind of early, and uh, I just didn't go anymore. My college was the comedy store, night after night after night after night. I watched the professors there, right? And I, I, I took notes, and that's that was my college. Uh, and um, I really, uh, uh, I, I'm glad I did did that. I, I don't know if I was in. I, I, I didn't want to become something I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be always wondering, gee, I have, would I have been? Could I have been a stand-up? Could I, you know, and try to be funny in the morning meeting? I didn't, I didn't want to be that guy. So, uh... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like, yeah, sure I wasn't. But, um... Uh, uh... Yeah, but, and, and um, where are you based out of? Are you out of uh, California? Are you in California? Are you in... I, I, right now I live in Redding, but I'm born and raised in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Holy shitty zoo. Yep, Holy City Zoo. Never got to uh, go there or perform there, of course. But, um, yeah, I mean, all those guys that started out there are pretty legendary. I got I got really lucky. I, I, because I was at the comedy store, I met Robin Williams, of course, and we became friends. And then years later, I went to San Francisco. Right. And I went to the Holy City Zoo. And I went in there with my little uh, press kit and everything I could do. And I... Went up to the guy and uh, he no, no, we don't. Uh, and uh, I turned around and I said, okay, you know, because they're very provincial. They, mm. they really didn't want people from L.A. They had their own thing going on. Mm. And as I'm walking, turning to leave, Robin came in and he was half owner and he starts giving me a big hug. And, hey, Joey, it's good to see you. Hey, my friend. And uh, walks me over to the same guy and goes, and of course, you're going to book my friend, right? The guy <laughs> the guy goes, oh yeah, let me have some stuff. Uh, let me. <laughs> and uh, so I got, I was, I was really lucky. I got to play San Francisco a lot through the zoo and do Alex Bennett in the morning the radio show and all of that. And um, the kind of the same thing happened in in uh, uh, Houston. And I went down to Houston for the first time uh, in 1982. I started to, well, I went to. I had a lot of friends at the Houston Comedy Workshop Annex. And I was playing the Laugh Stop, which was the big uh, Copacabana type comedy club in town. And mm-hmm. they were the uh, basically the comedy store type place. And uh, I started to, uh, that's where Bill Hicks came out of in San Kinison. And, uh, yep. uh, oh gosh, it's like Green I know. And, and so many people came out of there. Yeah. And uh, uh, I started to perform there. And uh, and then I was living in Houston for a while, and I had a home club. So I actually had three. I, I actually had three clubs. I can say I'm an alumni with legitimately, and that's uh, well four if you count the improv because I was at the improv in L.A. too. So it's yeah, kind of nice. Um, yeah, in in that respect, and uh, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a, a as a. As a Grateful Dead would say, it's a long, strange trip to spin, but it's a it's a great trip. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what year did you uh, first uh, go up at the Comedy Store? March fifteenth, nineteen seventy six. I've been hanging around there. Uh, the year prior to that, in seventy five, I went during the summer to see Freddie Prinze open for Helen Reddy at the uh, at the Universal Amphitheater, uh-huh. and. Uh, that was amazing. And then I saw Richard Pryor at the Schubert Theater mm-hmm. uh, in Los Angeles. I saw him there in uh, late October 75, two nights out of the six that he was there. And I heard he hung out at a place called the Comedy Store in L.A. So in November of that year, I started to go hang at the Comedy Store waiting for Richard. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like waiting for Goudot because he was never, 
And then finally, after like three months, he showed up one Saturday night and mm -hmm. just blew the roof off the joint. And uh, uh, I decided, uh, that was like February, I decided after seeing him live and hanging around, hanging around, I decided I was gonna try to do stand-up. And uh, the great stand-ups that were hanging around at the time were like Steve Landisberg and Leno and Leno. Yeah. And I was learning from these guys and I remember Steve Landisberg, who was Dietrich on Barney Miller. I went up to him and I went, so uh, Steve, you know, I'm thinking of going up Monday night, but they only give you five minutes. Is that, uh, is that okay? And he looks at me and he says, uh, I mean, you know, is it enough time to get him going? And he looks at me and he goes, enough time. Yeah. The fucking eternity <laughs> if you're not funny. And I said, oh yeah, you're right, it is, isn't it? So we went over to the Hyatt House next door and had coffee and <laughs> 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 I listened to him intently on how to how to put together four or five minutes to go up and do it and not uh, go up there and try to do an hour or try to be funny and, and not with, with nothing funny in my hands so uh, it was uh, uh, it was the best advice and actually the first time I ever went on Mitzi made me a Mitzi made me a regular at the store I'd never done stand-up before I didn't even know what I was doing but I had a great set uh, comparatively speaking and she called me over. I thought she was going to throw me out because I, I dropped so many F-bombs and the, uh, I was so nervous and I thought she was going to throw me out but she uh, she said, how long are you doing this? I said, that's the first time I ever went out. Oh my God, that was wonderful. You got to call in for spots. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, that was great and it wasn't because then I was going on and I didn't know what I was doing and it was the, the first two years were, were agonizing and then suddenly it, it began to come together. There was a guy named Mitch Walters who pulled me aside. And yeah. He was one of the greatest joke writers ever and he pulled me aside and he uh, said, here's how you do it. You put together your bits and, and he helped me put my <laughs> act together. So, um, yeah, it was pretty cool. And then from yeah. there it was, uh, I really began to uh, uh, work all the time after in 78 and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, I I talked to a lot of the old old guys like uh, Dreesen and Jack Perdue and Barry Diamond and Kerry Snow and uh, Carl, God rest his soul. Um, Carl LeBeau, yeah, we just lost Carl. Yeah, oh the God, that was that a funny was, guy. Yeah, he was he was very underrated. That was so devastating and stuff. I I I I, I uh, back uh, when Carl and Sam were first in L.A. We were in a, a group together called National Sports Lab. <laughs> and uh, we did sketches. We did comedy-based sports, sports comedy-based sketches, and uh, it was really great. It, it was we had something going on, and then the guy that originally put it together turned out to be a nut, and it, it kind of <laughs> fell apart. But that happens. Yeah, <laughs> that happens. <laughs> that uh, happens all the time. Yeah. One second. Everything all right there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. No, 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 I was talking to my roommate. Oh, okay. Um, and he I just, uh, I wanted to make sure everything is, because it's hot out, and it's beginning to get very hot. I understand part of California is going to melt today, and we're going to stay on the air until those streets are melted. <laughs> uh, no, it's just, it's really hot. It's the kind of weather where more idiots can race their cars on the freeway. Yeah. Jeez, uh, whiz. Anyway. We have overcast over here. So, already? Yeah. Really? Yeah, right now it's overcast, but we've been having really hot weather the last two or three weeks now. Now, Reading is up north, correct? Yes. Yes, okay. So, I, all right, because Redlands is down here, and Reading doesn't have as many rednecks as Redlands. Redlands has more rednecks, and Reading has fewer rednecks. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Very good yeah, way to sorry. put it. I try to balance out my, I, I know where to go in California and, and uh, not, uh, you know, you run into some Trumpers out here. They're very interesting people. Oh, yeah. They're living, <laughs> yeah, they're living in 2015. It's very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so did you take part in the strike? He's coming back. No, he's not. Uh, <laughs> no, but I think Trump, uh, Trump 24... Uh, to life in prison is pretty much what I, my bumper sticker is saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so did so. You know, no, I'm sure the people listening are not upset. 
No. No. <laughs> no. Otherwise, what the hell would you be listening to me for? No, I don't think. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I. so did you did you take part in the strike? No. No. Um, the reason was there were uh, uh, there's a long story about the strike. Mm-hmm. Uh, the strike was not a strike. Uh, I had lunch with Yoda at Asner. Yeah. He's a great guy. I'm, I'm sitting there having lunch with him. I've talked to Ed Asner, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was sitting there having lunch with him. And he, um, out of nowhere, uh, he looked up at me and he goes, so yeah, you crossed the ticket line right at the store. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah, that wasn't a strike. <laughs> that was a vendetta. That was, they were using a lot of young kids to try to get some, and then... I said, well, I believe that the comic should have been paid, but I'd really only been doing it solidly for six months, and I had nine minutes. Where were they going to pay me? What were they going to pay me? I did do a show from England uh, called uh, The Comedians, Mary Productions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's fine. I did my nine minutes. <laughs> and, and, you know, how many minutes? I, I didn't have enough minutes, and I just... But that wasn't it. There were a lot of people involved in that who weren't even stand-ups. Uh, there were, uh, it, it was not exactly, uh, uh, I just felt that the, that it was more of a, a revenge. Yeah. Because I heard more, more guys saying, I'm going to get even with this bitch and I'm going to get even. And I'm like, well, I'm not here to get even. Right. And also I was told don't worry, I was managing the Westwood Comedy Store. I was the, the uh, I managed the bar, I cleaned up at night, I locked the doors, I taught Sam and Carl how to sleep in the club, I taught his brother how to sleep in the club. <laughs> <laughs> they got nowhere to go. Vacuum that stage real good and then lay this down. So, uh, uh, you know, I mean, to, for me to strike, the first, the first meeting we had got... Uh, People wanted to look at her books and all. You're not a business partner. And it all got blown. It got, it got insane. Right. Um, you know, Mitzi was being struck by people she had dated. Uh, she was being struck by people that were upset that she didn't date them anymore. I, I won't go any further with that. I'm not going to. I mean, right. I could. But, but the point is that there was... A lot of that involved, and I didn't want anything to do with that, quite honestly. Of course. Um, I was never against the comedians getting paid. She originally was going to pay everybody in the main room. Yeah. And you worked your way up to the main room through the original and the uh, and Westwood. And uh, she talked about doing $10 spots in those rooms, and then on the weekends or during the, whatever, the main room, you got the big money you worked your way up. That wasn't good enough. It started a whole bunch of shit. People were screaming and yelling. And uh, I was the first guy to go on stage during the strike because I got really pissed off one night because I was still working the door. And mm-hmm. I was downstairs and there, everybody was uh, uh, yelling and screaming. And uh, uh, one comic said to me, uh, you know, uh, one day you're going to turn around, you're going to see me and so and so and so and so, and you're going to why you don't have a career. And uh, I said, okay, watch this. So I went up and I went on stage and I banged on the window and I went, look, I got all the spots. They weren't too happy about it. And uh, I I did it because, again, there was myself, Charlie Hill, uh, Gary Shandley, uh, Steve Landisberg, uh, Mike Binder, Biff Maynard, Marty Cohn. Uh, uh, We all crossed the line because the strike was the, it wasn't a strike, it was a protest. Right. He never mm-hmm. formed a union. To form a union, two of them, all they had to do, two of them, was go down to do, do a, uh, and, and register a union, a uh, local 101 comedians union with the first two members. Now you got a union. Now you can do things. But it didn't work that way. There were too many, too many, uh, you know, I, I haven't read the book because the book is all one sided. <laughs> right. And they don't. Uh, uh, they don't talk about a lot of things. There's things in there about uh, <coughs> uh, a friend of mine, uh, that Ollie Trader, that he was oh, yeah. a beast and a this and a that. The guy was a great comedian. Right. He gave Ollie jokes. We 
would give Ali the jokes we thought couldn't work, and Ali would go on stage and make them work. He would take the scraps and turn them into a banquet. And a lot of comics didn't like that shit. Well, tough shit. Joey Gaynor took scraps and turned them into a banquet. I learned how to do that. When you when you are struggling and a, a great comic throws something aside and goes, oh, I ain't going to do that, and you'll say to him, can I try it? Yeah, go ahead. Boom, you can actually make something like that. Right, and if you get permission, you can go and do something like that. Ollie, Ollie, I gave Ollie a bunch of my uh, uh, stuff that I didn't do anymore because it was dirty, it was hysterically funny, but I just wasn't doing that. Yeah. So, and Ollie, uh, uh, it's funny when people would say, well, Ollie stole from me. Well, you probably didn't pay him for the coke, Jack Off, so yeah. probably why you fucking jokes. So let's, let's talk some serious uh so she brought up the strike. Yeah, there were people that that were heading that strike. There were people that had it in their heart seriously. There were people that were misled. And there were people that were full of shit. And the biggest leaders, some of the biggest leaders were full of shit. And, right. uh, and guys like, uh, it's really funny, because guys like Letterman, etc. They, they were still my friend after when it was all done. Right. Uh, uh, so... Whoever was my friend was my friend before or before and after. And there were people, what was really sad was when you see people marching in a line that, because I ran the potluck nights for Mitzi, which was a very important job. It really was. Right. And it was a haggering job. I mean, because you had all kinds of nuts showing up. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, really, I mean, basket cases in some instances, very funny to put them up, but but sad. And then to see these same people being told, they're coming up to me and they're ticketing and coming up to me going, you know, when I'm a big TV star and I'm going, my God, you can't even, you you know, you can't even put two sentences together. You're like, what are you talking about? And and it was very sad. Yeah. And, and it wasn't, I was on a pedestal look at, no, you can, believe me, you watch people long enough, you know if they're funny, you know if they're not. Yeah. And a lot of these people who are never were in the business uh, were out there picketing, hoping they were going to get something from the, the people that told them, we'll give you this and give you that if you come and help us. Yeah. And uh, it was misleading and unfair. And, uh, uh, and, and it was bullshit. I mean, it really was. <laughs> but, yeah, they, Mitzi paid everybody. They came to a conclusion. But... Uh, they would have got that conclusion a lot sooner had uh, uh, personal uh, personal bullshit. Mm -hmm. you know, one comic said to me, I'm getting even with her because I, I was working the club and I got I got a drunk driving driving home and she wouldn't bail me out. Well, whose fucking fault is that? I mean, give me a break. You know, you know, you, you, here's a woman that that the uh, uh, paid for people's food a lot of times and yet you you know so she's gonna. So you're going to go out and break the law, and then she's she's responsible for you? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And, uh, uh, but, you know, overall, I love everyone. Yeah. Uh, even the, e yes, I do. Even the uh, aliens who live down in uh, Antarctica under the ice, uh, they're good people. I know them. If so, you're... Uh, <laughs> I want <laughs> if... Are you at liberty to say who set the uh, fire to the improv main room? I have no idea, but it wasn't Ollie Prater, that's for sure. Yeah. Ollie I'm... was already... Ollie, when they said that, first of all, Ollie, Ollie didn't have time to set fire to the fucking... Yeah. You know what? I would say this. The improv wasn't making money, so who knows? Yeah, because I heard it was... that People have always said it was either him or Biff Maynard. I don't know, you know, if it was either no, one. Uh, uh, no. No, they, no one knows who set the fire, and it, the funniest part is mm -hmm. um, when the improv started. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, a term, a term for lightning. Uh, it's, it's kind of a gross term. I won't use it. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I knew Bud. Bud was very good to me. Um, uh, as soon as the comedians were 
ticketing for money, but began to pay sixteen dollars a show. Mm-hmm. Uh, the that you know, I don't uh, the the improv. I I really don't know other than that it was a fire and they rebuilt it. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I'm very sorry. It's okay. Uh, that was the no. That's okay. That was. Uh, the ghost of one of the old dead improv comics. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I'll tell you something funny, though. Uh-huh. I would go there on Sunday nights when I started out. Mm-hmm. I'd be going there on Sunday nights, and the uh, audiences were very, they weren't like the the, the, the uh, audience at the comedy store for potluck night, because it was singers, and, 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 and there would be singers there dressed in their... Uh, uh, like almost a tuxedo to sing at the improv on, you know, on potluck night. And that would, I, I, I would be laughing because it just seemed stupid that this is a sawdust on the floor joint. You're wearing a fucking tuxedo. I mean, give me a break. So, but I digress. Um, <laughs> it, Bud was really cool uh, with me when I started to work. Uh, and um, mm-hmm. I was getting spots at both places, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the improv and the store. And then I began to work the door at the store and I would do spots at the improv. And uh, I was working more and more at the store, so I didn't go to the improv as much. But I was always, uh, always, uh, whether there was the strike or whatever, I was never persona non grata mm-hmm. in either club. Now, Mitzi told me, you know, I would have my out, my, my ins and outs with Mitzi, but never with Bud. If I called Bud and I wanted spots, I got on. He never, uh, and I, I worked, I did manual labor for both clubs. I mean, because when you start out, you do stuff so you don't have to go work somewhere else. You want to be around the club. You want to be around the business somehow. So I worked for Bud. Um, we moved furniture to the Vegas place. I helped them. Uh, I would do stuff like that. And then you know, for a few hours in the day and then uh, and then hang around the club at night trying to get on or go over to the store. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't say that, uh, and as a matter of fact, there was another club in L.A. called Big V's. Jan Smith was a great guy. Yeah. That was a really, that was a fun club. And uh, that's gone. I, I know the Ice House is probably going to reopen in 2022. Mm-hmm. The buses own it. And I understand they're putting mm-hmm. in more seating. I think they're going to make it a 12,000 seat arena in Pasadena. So a lot of people's houses are getting knocked down. And uh, I'm only kidding. I know people, <laughs> you know, people believe that shit. They believe QAnon. They'll believe that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's a, that was a club where um, I kind of made a resurgence in the, the late nineties. Yeah. And uh, I started <laughs> running shows there and, um, for a uh, for one of the producers of Second City, mm-hmm. uh, former producers Kim Lamori, so I began to run her shows there, and, uh, and now I have no idea where I'm going with this because it all started out. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, when 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 Sam's huh? when Sam's career took off, you became one of his outlaws, right? You know what? Here's the truth. Uh huh. When Sam's uh, career took off. I was going on the road and stuff. Yeah. And when he began to have his thing, uh, I was not. I I hung out with Sam. We all hung out together, but I was not in the. I never went on the road with him as as an outlaw or anything. Oh, I thought I always you did. considered myself a gunslinger. I come to town, I shoot shit up, and get out of there. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, I it, there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, that, I, I'm glad I didn't. Number one, uh, Sam had four very talented guys working with him, so it didn't matter. But also, I didn't mule. So that, <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. I wouldn't mule. So if you wouldn't mule, you know, because I wasn't, I wasn't <clears throat> a snowbird in the 80s. I didn't do blow. And uh, with Sam, as he got... Uh, as he did more and more blow, he began to distrust people who didn't do blow. The coke, coke is really a bad drug. Yeah. I mean, I really, I, it's, that had a lot to do with his uh, downfall as a, uh, in career-wise. Right. Uh, and uh, I was never, I was never an outlaw, but we, again, we were really good friends. 
Uh-huh. And then he got really mad at me. I did the, I don't know if you ever heard of the show Coast to Coast. Uh, with Ray Bell. No. Uh, it's a national, it's been on forever. Now, uh, there's George Orr, he's a host. It's a, it's a paranormal show, etc. Anyways, the cat named me and pun it. This is like 20 years ago, actually. Interviewed me about, because uh, they were doing a thing on the Yatub script, and Sam was going to do the movie The Yatub. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The night that they were, yeah, the night they were talking about that, Hollywood legends and stuff, somebody, uh, some guy told a, a fantastic, beautiful tale that wasn't at all true about the Yatub script and Sam. Sam read the script, and the next day he drove his car into a wall, and mm-hmm. uh, it was insane. The guy didn't know. So I sent a little note saying, listen, you know, that's not what it is. And, and uh, if you want to verify me, I can tell you that this guy's telling you a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. So the next day, they, the next day I got a call from, uh, from Coast to Coast, would you like to do the show? So I did the show, and I told this story, and I, I told this story in the, in the movie I Am Sam Kinison. And it's yeah. true. Sam's getting all set to go do the Atuk movie. We're having a big going away party up at his house above the Ch- Chateau Marmont. He had that. Was getting, he, had his, he was renting his manager's house, and we're all up there partying, and uh, he's leaving the following Tuesday to go to New York. So I turned to him and I said, so you like the script? It's a really good script? Mm-hmm. And he says, I don't know, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> and I, I, I almost dropped my drink. I said, what? You haven't read the script? I mean, is it a new version, or you haven't read it? And Sam goes, no, man, I'll read it on the plane, and then when we get there, you know, if we need to make any changes. And I went, no, Sam, Sam, uh, no, understand something. How long ago did you get the script? He goes, I got it two months ago. What do I care? I, I said, two months. I said, and it was probably more than two months, because according to Bill, he got it four months prior, mm-hmm. and uh, his brother. And so he yeah. never read it. And then I told him, I said, when you get there, they're ready to shoot what you've got in your hand. You can't just go, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that. They've already, there's a, there's a production manager that has a chart mapping this out day by day, movement by movement. You, like, what, I, I, had been, I had been working with Robert Townsend, who is a fantastic director. Yep. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, sat me down and we, he, he, I learned a lot of stuff. Whenever I worked on a set, I would be all ears and eyes on the director and the cameraman. It's the two guys you want to know. That's the two people you want to make friends with, you want to take them to dinner, you want to, when you're in a movie or a TV show, the cameraman and the director, okay? Everybody else, hi, how are you, that's nice. I'm not saying be a dick, but you really got to be friendly with them. You really got to work. Those are the people whose ass you kiss. Yeah. (laughs) Anyways, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm explaining to him that this isn't going to, you can't do that. And and uh, this is going to be a disaster. I'm telling him that this is going to be a disaster. Right. And he got real pissed. What do you know? Well, what happened? He went to New York and it was a fucking disaster. Yeah. And they say he was standing up for his, you know, he didn't want to scream in every scene. I understand that. But dude. You know, all you had to do instead of making all this shit, you already, you've already screwed yourself. Is when you get to a scene, they want you to scream again. Just say, "Isn't this a bit much? Don't you think all the screaming's a bit much? Shouldn't we punctuate?" Shit, but that wasn't. You know, bull in a china shop don't act that way. A bull in a china shop breaks all the china, then goes, "What the fuck happened?" Yeah. Uh, you know, so. Uh, to me, that was, and so Sam didn't talk to me for like three or four years. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and then uh, during that time, he was doing different stuff. Uh, yeah. But he was really drugging out and having problems. And I was doing some, I did the TV show First and Ten. Yep. With O.J. Simpson. Yep. And I, I did uh, the Five Heartbeats, and I, I did a movie with Chad McQueen, Marshall Law, where I got beat up real good. It was great. Yeah. And, uh, TV and you're doing movies, that's great. 
he wanted to be friends. And I realized this guy has been, he has uh, seen the top of the mountain and now he's fallen to the floor. Right. And uh, I'm not going to be a dick. And I said, yeah, man, how you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, you're back. It's, you know. And we hugged and everything. And I, I said to myself, you know, I could, I could act like I'm a big deal, but I'm not. I'm a working actor, but I'm not going to, you know, this guy has been, he's, put, he's done it all to himself. Yeah. So, uh, and I like Sam. I had nothing against Sam. We, Sam and I had a lot of religious talks. He would not believe yeah, because uh, the guy was a preacher. He did last rites. We talked about stuff paranormally. That I mean, we did a séance once in the main room. Me, Sam, Carl, Freddie Asparagus, Russell Soul. Oh God, Jesus, yeah. all these guys. Everybody, uh, I think everybody that was in the séance is God but me. And uh, we we were in the main room and, and we heard a baby cry. We heard a baby cry. And. Years later, when I got more information about the store, I figured it out that uh, the showgirls from Ciro's, when it was the Ciro's nightclub in the 40s, they were showgirls. And yeah. They'd come down and dance. And, uh, upstairs was their makeup facility, so one of the girls probably had her baby upstairs. Uh, downstairs, Frank Sennis kept a retired nurse to do abortions when one of the mob guys or stars would knock up a waitress or a starlet or a, <laughs> a, a dancer. Go, yeah, really, it's yeah. really incredible, incredible shit. And, um, <laughs> and uh, as a good Catholic boy who served Mass, this is all wonderful stuff for my new book, Holy Shit, There's More Than You Think. Yeah, uh, yeah and then... And that's when I had uh, some real big paranormal experiences there too. So it's, it's the comedy store has opened more doors for me to go more places around this world. Stand-up comedy and and being known for working at the store and meeting people and everything. Um, uh, I don't think uh, Thorpe. Well, that's an old reference. Who else is this? Well, we don't really have too many adventures anyway. I was going to say Thor Heyerdahl, yeah. but that. <laughs> That's going way back, and I don't want to say John Gunther because nobody remembers I Road to Adventure. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, especially the millennial kids, there was a whole fucking world before you were born. Get into the, 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 the history here. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's you know before cell phones, people actually you know didn't care about talking to each other that much. So, but um, uh, uh, it's. Uh, uh, Look, here's what I say when people tell me, I don't know, I'm getting into another thing, but I'll uh-huh. just say this. When people tell me that there are no aliens, that there is no other life forms, that all the ancient alien stuff is baloney. Yeah. I've been on the earth 65 years, thank God, hopefully another 65, whatever, but 65 years. And in that time, I've seen multiple assassinations, multiple wars. Uh, countries actually change their name, become different countries. Uh, I've known stars who've committed suicide. I've seen all of this happen in a short 65 years. So they'll tell me like two two million years ago, something wasn't going on here. You know, the planet doesn't die. Just the, you know, so uh, uh, it's just amazing to me how much uh, uh, I've seen and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to put it all into a book, but I don't know if I can put it all in a book. I can yeah. bring as much as I can. Maybe two books. Uh, Volume two. Well, I worked in the wrestling world too. I just spoke. I had a cousin that was a big time wrestler, the big star in the eighties. Uh, Keith Frankie. His uh, wrestling name was Adrian Adonis. Oh yeah. We were, uh, yeah, we were far cousins, and I finally just talked to his daughter. Uh, after many years, he passed. He was killed in a car wreck in '88. Oh god. And I finally spoke with his daughter, who I haven't seen since she was about eight or nine years old. So. Um, that's another chapter that I'm trying to put together because working with wrestlers is, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a lot like stand up only you can get punched. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, well, in the old days, wrestlers had no sense of humor about their business. Oh yeah. Make a joke. Now it's, you know, now it's all the, the cat's out of the bag is entertainment. But, uh, right. In the old days, yeah. So, so, uh, so, so let me ask about um, some of your credits sure. here. 
1988, you got to be in Comedy's Dirtiest Dozen, and two comedian friends of mine were in that, Stephanie Hodge and Steve Pearl. Um, how was that experience for you? Well, Steve, I have to thank Steve because he got, uh, he got Rick Messina and Rick Baker to look at me twice. The mm -hmm. first time they saw me, I had no idea they were in the room. It was really late at night. It was sparse. And I was having a one of those uh, go fuck yourself sets. <laughs> 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 and then uh, Steve said, "No, no, you got to." He told him, "You got to come back and see him when he's, you know, this is a." Yeah, and it was. It was like eleven people in the room. There was nothing going on, and uh, I was closing up the room. So uh, I I got to do that. Stephanie Hodge is very funny. She was really she killed in that movie yeah. uh, we all did but the experience of doing it was great we went to New York uh, it's the only time I got to do anything on film with Bill Hicks uh, Otto and George we've lost some people from the movie we lost Bill Hicks John Fox Otto and George and Monty Hoffman are gone yeah. and uh, uh, the experience was great because I hadn't I'm from New Jersey, but I've been living in California a long time, and I really didn't experience New York City other than visiting it as a little kid, going to the movies or going to the Easter show or whatever in New York City. So hanging with Steve, who's from the city, that whole two weeks that we were there, we stayed at a friend's house of mine in the village, right. which was outrageous. And every night we went to a different blues show, uh, or we went to a different comedy venue or something every night. New York, I, I don't know why anybody would even take drugs in New York. New York's the drug. I mean, you walk out on the street, boom. Uh, uh, actually, it's like when San Francisco was, uh, before, I remember back in the day, well, why would you take drugs there? It was so alive and vibrant, mm -hmm. you got high off the city. So because uh, we had friends that were like, let's sit in the hotel and do blow. And we're like, get the fuck out of here. It's New York, man. You know, the city is blow. Let's go. <laughs> so, yeah, we went to the, the, like the Lone Star Saloon and we went to uh, the BB Kings and we went, we went to uh, a, a Johnny Winter rehearsal, uh, the great Johnny Winter, who's no longer with us. And uh, uh, it was just great. We had, uh, we had a great time. It, it was an experience, um, that uh, I learned a lot doing it. Again, I made friends with Lenny Wong, the cameraman, uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, the director, and, and that helped a lot. Um, they, and the, only, the only regret I have is that uh, Bill and I had two similar bits. Now, uh -huh. at that time, Bill was working England and the East Coast mostly. Bill hadn't seen me, I hadn't seen him. We both had a bit about Ronald Reagan can't die. Uh, cancer, bullets, radiation, this fucking guy won't die. He's like Reagenstein. He just keeps getting up. <laughs> and he had something similar. So the producers came to me and they go, uh, we, we don't want you to do yours because we want Bill to do his. Yeah. So, uh, okay, I cut that and I... The, the stuff I thought really killed, they cut out of the movie, and the stuff that I didn't <laughs> like, they kept it. But, and you know what? People have seen it, they like it. I don't, uh, I don't insult anybody's intelligence. I'm glad that people enjoyed what they saw. Pearl was really funny. Everybody did a great job at the movie. Yeah. And the movie would have been a huge success. Uh, Tim Allen and Chris Rock, of course, became the biggest names out of it. But the, uh, and Stephanie would be, I would say, right there because she had the series. But the movie mm -hmm. would have been a huge success mm -hmm. if the asshole producer, Stu Shapiro, never put an ad in TV Guide and the Cable Guides and oh, God. anywhere else he could put it. The movie you will never see on HBO or Showtime. And HBO and Showtime said, fine, shove your movie up your ass. So that's why you'll you'll never see it on HBO or Showtime, Ugh. and it's unfortunate because <clears throat> there are performances in there. Bill Hicks's performance is, is outstanding. I mean, it's it's incredible. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's what guys wish they could do today. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, 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 the fact that it's it's. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't even get residuals for years. I had to go to the union and say, hey, don't we get 
money when this runs pay per view or whatever. Yeah. So we get a pit, and actually MGM bought it. Mm-hmm. MGM bought it. So I, I would not be surprised if it, if it streams on on something MGM owns, or if it becomes a. Uh, uh, well, HBO and Showtime own almost everything, but right. Yeah. Oh, and uh, so so. That would be really cool if that happens. That would be, um, yeah. Yeah, because it's a cult film, but um, see, what's what's cool is, you know, they did the movie, on, they did the show off Dying Up Here. Mm-hmm. Now, the show, uh, it just had nothing to do with the actors or whatever, but the show was <laughs> made as, as living then. It would be like watching a movie about Vietnam and no one gets killed. Uh, <laughs> watching this, show and I'm like they don't talk about Vietnam they don't talk about Nixon they don't talk about racism or woman yeah. all of the all of the uh, the bits the comedians are doing seem to be this psychological trauma crap and uh, uh, the interesting thing was though that made a lot of new comedians really want to see what the early comedy store was like, the early improv, the early, early days. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've never had as many uh, younger comics come up and ask me questions about, I mean, I, I love telling them, I don't mind, you know, they'll come, you knew Bill Hicks, and, and it's like, yeah, I'm a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that's, uh, uh, what's cool is like, suddenly, now the, the cause of that show, as much as I didn't think it was a great show, I, I thought the, the actors did their job. It's just that it, it, it was weird. It was like a, a weird scenario. Um, uh, it brought back a reverence for older comics, older like the comics that came before you. When I when I started out, guys like Pat Cooper, Milton Berle, these guys were gods. Right. And then I noticed over the years. Uh, like maybe 20 years ago, new comics would just look at guys who'd been doing it for a while and call them dinosaurs, and I'm reinventing the wheel, and you're not reinventing the wheel, dude. What'd you do for some baseball cards and this folks? Big fucking deal. Yeah. You're not reinventing the wheel. And uh, now it's more and more comedians that are coming up with writing comedy. I see more and more funny people uh, and people that are really... Uh, trying to be funny and are reverent about the, about the craft. They're not just doing it uh, because it's something cool to do. And, A sitcom, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so that's, uh, uh, that's the good side of, 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 uh, of what's happening now. And there is, there's more good sides than that, too. I mean, what they've done with the comedy store is fantastic. Oh, they yeah. took it out of the, out of the, uh, the Middle Ages. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and turned it into, I mean, they got a podcast room, they got all this great stuff going on. Right. And uh, and I literally, I will tell you, uh, literally will tell you that uh, uh, I think it's it's fantastic because we even have a, uh, uh, hang on one second. This okay. might be emergency call. Hold on one second. Okay. This is amazing. One second, they're done. Do 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 We shall see. Hello? Yep. Yes. Uh yeah, that was see, that was a good emergency call. That was my roommate call to say I hate the bug it, but is the cat outside? No. <laughs> and, <laughs> so and, and truthfully, if it would have been so and so's in jail, that would have pissed me off. But I'm I'm more worried about the <laughs> I will I will say that because it's really warm out, and uh, although I'd like to leave the cat out there because oh I could go for such a bad dirty joke right now. I'm not gonna... <laughs> okay, I must move on. Uh, I, I, you knew Jonathan Winters. You worked with him. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what was that like? Well, here's what's great. Uh, I had a partner, Freddie Asparagus. Now, you've seen the movie Three Amigos. He's, He's the bartender, yeah. You know right away who he is. <clears throat> bartender. Everybody, oh, yeah, that guy. 
Yeah. We used to do this bit. I was the manager. He was the wrestler. And in 1981, I went partners with a guy on a little film shop in Hollywood mm -hmm. in this little uh, nook called the Artisan's Patio. It's a little tiny hole in the wall, and we sold super eight, like Disney films and stuff, sound movies and, and 16 millimeter films. Because I've always been a film collector. Mm -hmm. I'm crazy. I'm literally crazy. Mm -hmm. but, because now it weighs too much. But um, I don't have what I used to have. But uh, I was, I would be there because then uh, from there at five o'clock I'd go eat and go to the comedy store. So I'm, I'm, you know, it was fun all day. I could do it, sit in there and write and do whatever. And like Bill Hicks would come and hang out, and Riley Barber, and uh, blah blah blah. One day I'm standing there and here comes this guy in a cowboy hat. Uh, mm -hmm. This big fellow, he walks in, takes his sunglasses off. He looks at me and he goes, "So you sell film in here, huh?" Uh, you got any movies with, uh, with those, uh, what do you call those, uh, uh, and I go strippers? And he goes, yeah, strippers, uh, but I want them putting their clothes on. Yeah. You got any films of strippers putting their clothes on? And it's Jonathan Winters. And I, I'm standing there and I'm like, wow, man. I, I mean, you know, I know Robin and now I'm standing here talking to Jonathan and Jonathan says to me, you look a bit parched there, uh, partner. Could you use a soda? I said, yeah. He goes, I'll be back. And he comes back from the pizzeria with two big sodas. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to get friendly with it. So it's been, it's been ahead about three years, four years. And Fred and I are doing our, our uh, the, the, well, we had a whole act. We would do the wrestling routine, but then we had a whole act. We had music in it. We did a, we, we were a really good team. We, we were really funny. Um, and uh, we get a call from a guy named Peter Ferrara, and he says, I'm doing uh, the, uh, uh, the Jonathan Winters on the ledge, and I want you guys to come on as the wrestlers and interact with Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And we were salivating. We couldn't wait. And we get to the, to the, to the, uh, the, the thing, the, the, the studio, and uh, we shoot some stuff with Jonathan, and Robin was there. And we watch Robin shoot with Jonathan, mm -hmm. and then Robin sees us, and we we uh, we we go and do this thing with Jonathan for a few minutes. Because at six o'clock, Jonathan stops. That's it. It's gonna be in the middle of something. Six o'clock, boom, he's done. Yeah. Uh, like Spencer Tracy, boom, <laughs> or, or any of the, uh, what was the other guy that did that Barry Moore? But, yeah. Uh, so we do about six minutes with him, and uh, with him on screen. And, uh, well, that, that's it. That's, we're up. that's all our time. But it was funny stuff because he's going, so he's got this pawn shop, the antique shop. He goes, so you guys jump on each other's nuts, huh? And we're doing a whole thing. You know, and he starts uh, going back and forth, forth with Fred. And then uh, cut. And when it cut, the show comes out, they, uh, they cut what we did. <laughs> <laughs> What's her name? The, the blonde actress who was a big star at the time. Not Susan Anton. Maybe it was Susan Anton. I'm not sure. Maybe. But she came in there and it was the most wasteful three or four minutes. I mean, don't go in there and improv with the greatest if you don't know what you're doing. You don't know improv. Yeah. <laughs> she could not improv. She could not improv. Anyway, I'm not going to. So what Peter did was he took our... Uh, he took the, 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 the tape that I shot previously to that, like a year or two before, mm -hmm. and edited it in with Milton Burrow while Milton's watching the television. We, he keep, we keep popping up on the screen. And that was so we could still be in the, in the, in the show. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, otherwise it was edited out to keep, because it was, it, it was great to work with him for six minutes. It was amazing. I mean, we were just, we were flying. It was really, really funny. Um, I don't know why they, I mean, I'm assuming they, they cut us because we were not a big name. Yeah. And I mean that. Otherwise, everybody in it, other than Brian Bradley, who did a Charles Nelson Riley type thing. Yeah. And that was only about a minute. Otherwise, everybody else was a, was a name, so they... Went, uh, and it was Showtime at Walden, so Showtime, Showtime did the same thing with the Comedy Store uh, documentary. Uh, they mainly wanted names, and they mainly, mainly wanted uh, 
more of the newer names. Right. Um, uh, but what's funny is people said, well, you're not interviewed on it. I said, yeah, but you saw the last episode, right? They go, yeah. I said, well, uh, in the last episode, you see the photo come up of uh, the Diane Cannon, the Paul Mooney, and, and myself crowning Richard Fryer King of Comedy, right? Right. They go, yeah. I said, well, what, what more do you need to know? So, you know, that, that's fine with me. I mean, I, my photos show up in the show all over the place, but uh, people say, they didn't interview you. I went, yeah, it's all right. I'm in a lot of interviews. It's okay. Yeah, but they didn't interview And I said, no, it's all right. I said, on the last episode, that one photo coming towards you on the screen for like 20 seconds says more than what a lot of people said in their interviews. So uh, I'm fine with that. That's... Uh, only four people got the crown Richard that night. Me, Finus, Henderson, Diane Cannon, and Paul Mooney. Only, only four. So, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, and Diane Cannon will never admit to being there. It's hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> I, ran in, I ran into, I did, I ran into her at a Lakers game uh, like a year later. And I said, oh, Miss Cannon, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Joey Gaynor. We crowned Richard King of Comedy. I was never there. Yeah. God. And I'm like, wow, you know, well, you know, go to my Facebook, honey, if that's not you. So yeah. I think she became religious or something, and like, now you couldn't be around Richard or who the hell knows. Oh, I mean, God. Yeah. You know, um, um, Hollywood people crack me up. When they can't get an audience, they get religious. That's when they get yeah. religion. When they can't, when they ain't got no work, they get religion. They, so they get religion, get they have a social cause, all of that shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. makes me sick. And that's okay. A social yeah. cause is good, but when you find God because you're broke, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm broke. Hello, God, I'm broke now. But yeah, where were you when you could have kicked in? Yeah. So, uh, I always uh, crack up at that, you know. Yeah. You... Yeah, they get on religious TV and it's all of a sudden, you know, I just want to talk to all my friends in show business. Yeah. About what? Joining you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you had a here at TBS, huh? yeah. <laughs> you had a rule in all I want for Christmas. Oh, that was a uh, yeah. I did a commercial mm -hmm. for Blue Cross of Illinois, and the director. Uh, uh, what's his name? Um, hang on a second. I always get his name confused with the other guy. The director on that movie with, was uh, doing the commercial, and he wanted me and Michael Alamo to be in the movie, Michael Alamo. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to think of the director's name. I always Robert, confuse it with this other... Robert movie. Lieberman. Mm -hmm. Robert Lieberman, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I get cast in the movie. Originally, I was going to be the limo driver uh -huh. for, uh, for the mom. I was going to be her limo driver. Or for the grandmother, for Lauren Bacall or whatever. I, I don't know what the... But then they decided not to shoot New York. They're going to shoot on a Paramount lot, fake snow and everything. Yeah. And uh, I get on the set, and uh, I'm going to work with kids. Because when I got the script, I said, okay, all of my scenes, most of them are with these kids. Okay. So the first thing I thought of was W.C. Fields. And mm -hmm. his quote, when you're working in a scene with kids or animals, you're not even in the scene. doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> You're not in the scene. They're going to look at the kids or the animal. So I put that in my head. I said, fine. Um, knowing that now, I'm not... Uh, it, it, that, that was the first thing I thought. So when I got on the set uh, and I met uh, Ethan Randall and Thor Birch, yeah. uh, and God, it, it, she was already a genius. And mm. we get on <laughs> set and they introduced me to two kids. And uh, we're going to do the first scene that we're supposed to do in about an hour or two hours. And I said, uh, so how do you kids want to do this? Or how do you guys want to do this? I didn't say kids. I said, how do you guys want to do this? And mm -hmm. they looked at each other, looked at me, and they go, well, you're the adult. I went, yeah, but we're all actors here. So you tell me what, you know, how you want to do mm -hmm. it. And they were stunned that a grown-up would give them some leeway. They never, no one, no actor, no nobody ever said that to them. So then the... Uh, 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 the uh, the tutor, the fellow that was the tutor, came over to me and he goes, I, I I don't know what you did, but these kids can't wait to work with you. 
I said, oh, they, I, I asked them how they want to do the scene, and they said to me, you're the grown-up. So, and I said, no, we're all actors here, so you're part of this too now. Come on. Mm-hmm. I said, and plus, you've been on the set a few days. You could help me out. So he said, well, they, they, uh, they just think that's the greatest. Nobody's ever talked to them as an adult. They've always <laughs> talked down to them. You talk to them like actors. Yeah. And I swear to God, we had a great time on the set. Uh, Lauren Bacall was, I, I wasn't there, but I remember one of the kids saying to me, uh, that lady that smokes a lot, why does she keep yelling at us? Lauren <laughs> 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 Bacall would be like, why don't you kids go and sit down until it's your turn? You know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I said, oh, she's like Fred McMurray. All right, Bob, Jim, get the hell out of here. And, uh, 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 we we uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was really a lot of fun. And the only the only thing that happened that I wish didn't happen was um, they were using fake snow, and I got a sinus infection. Wow. So I ha- I had a miss shooting a scene where uh, we were making uh, Sundays. The scene is there, but I couldn't do. We were making Sundays, and I pop up from the under the counter. And I put the cherry on top of the Sunday between Ethan and Thora. Yeah. And Thora was supposed to kiss me on the cheek, but they thought I was contagious. And I was going to, like, you know, do a face and go back down and, like, melt under the counter. Like, oh, you know, like, like a kitty thing, a kid, a cute thing. And I didn't get to do it. But uh, that and uh, there was another uh, another scene where I was supposed to dance with the waitress in the uh, in one of the opening montages of the yeah. minor because I got sick, but, uh, but the, the funny part was, um, after that, I, I got some more work, um, some more stuff started coming in, commercials, this thing, that thing, mm-hmm. but it was really fun to be on the Paramount lot in the middle of summer, and uh, walk on a street full of snow, and, and, <laughs> and what was also cool, Kevin Nealon's in the movie, Kevin and I are old friends, Yeah. and we're hanging out, now they, they here's a cool thing, um, when you're looking, when you're in the diner, let's say, and you're sitting in a booth by the window, and mm-hmm. the two actors are in the booth by the window, and you can see across the street people walking by, and it's supposed to be a big, wide New York street. Well, it's not. It's a very, very narrow uh, studio street. So what they did was they got little people, and they put them in winter clothing and had them walk across the street in the diner, but on camera they look regular size, okay? They okay. don't look like little people. They look like adults, like 5'10", 6 foot, 5'8", walking across the street. It's all to do with the depth perception. So uh, for like three or four days, it was like the Wizard of Oz. We had all these little people on the set. Right. And about the third day, uh, this fellow comes walking up to me and Kevin, the two other guys, and uh, they're little people, and he walks up, and he, uh, he's got on a pork pie hat and uh, sideburns. And he's like, he looks like a, he's like a 35-year-old guy. I mean, I mean it's, it's, I'm, I'm trying to explain this without being... Make, <laughs> politically incorrect. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want the, the freaking cancel culture. You're making fun. No, this was an amazing thing. Yeah. He came up to us. He came up to us and he went, hey, I, I know you guys are like stars in the movie. Which I was flattered, you know. And he goes, well, how come you don't like dog bones to hang around with us? And I said, where do you guys eat? He said, in here. In this, in this one big uh, other part of a, a stage they had cut off for the extras. Yeah. He said, over here with the extras. So I looked at Kevin. Kevin looked at me and went, all right, we'll have our food brought in there for that. We're eating with you guys. Really? So we go in there. With our, we brought our trays in at dinner time and sat down. And, like, the whole place was jazzed because two of the main characters came in and ate with them. That was a big deal. I mean, who the, the people don't eat with the extras. People did the night. And uh, they were jazzed up because uh, we, we came in and sat with them. And, and, and a couple of nights in a row, we ate dinner in there until they were gone. And uh, they, they, it, was, uh, it was a big deal to the extras that, um, that we would come and sit with them. <laughs> And I didn't realize that, I never realized that on the set. I would just, if I was an extra, I just did whatever. I didn't think about anything. But um, mm-hmm. I guess for them, they felt a little un- unincluded, I guess would be the word. Yeah. And uh, I think it was because really nobody was talking to them or chatting with them. They were all herded 
as extras are, heard it in a place, and, uh, uh, you know, now when they have a hundred extras or whatever, and they're herded in a place, there's somebody there entertaining them all day. There's somebody there doing just like a warm-up guy. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, um, when you were on First and Ten, did you work with John Kassir? Yes. Yeah, and great John guy. Very funny. Great guy. I, I love that guy. I've talked to him. He's a great guy. Yeah. I, I meant to ask him if he ever got any residuals. I haven't got any residuals from that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's getting plenty of dough from Tales from the Crypt. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, I was just with the, the old producer from that a few, about a month ago. Very cool, that. Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Tales from the Crypt is great. Yeah, John, John was great on that show as, uh, 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 Crip, the kicker. Yeah. Really good. The Crypt Keeper, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was a fun show to work on. It really was. I got the first day, I got to work with Maury Amsterdam and Norman Fell and Arlene Galunka. Like wow. three sitcom, you know, uh, elder statesmen. And that was a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, I remember, uh, there was the, the Back in like 1981, for a little while, I was helping my friend and I was working managing a restaurant in Century City that made pizzas. Yeah. And I always wanted to learn to make pizzas. So I went and worked for him for a while to learn to make pizzas. He thought I really was working. I wanted to learn to make pizza. So this is why I've had a lot of different jobs. I wanted to learn how to do something, so if I had to do it, I know how to do it. End, end of story. So, um, which drives employers nuts because then you get good at what you're doing and you quit and they don't understand why. <laughs> um, I learned to make pizzas and Norman Fell would come down from his office in the ABC building there. They had the two buildings in uh, Century City here, the Schubert, and uh, he would come down and he'd go, a personal pepperoni? So I'm sitting on the set with him like uh, 10 years later and he keeps looking at me, looking at me, and he goes, I know you from somewhere. You look real real familiar. And I looked up at him and I went, one personal pepperoni, right, uh, coming right up. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the guy! And uh, uh, that was fun to work with him and Maury Amsterdam. And Maury Amsterdam, at the time, he had a hard time remembering his lines, but if you asked him a story about Dick Van Dyke, boy, he was right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, Arlene Galunka, who was on, like, Mayberry RFD and all these other, like, Love Boat and all that stuff, so. Uh, and then on the, on the regular shows, I mean, the actors were a lot of fun. It was around all these athletes, and... Uh, and OJ was actually fun to work with, but I, I got him to work. He liked to do his lines, stand there, deliver his lines, mm -hmm. not really have to do anything other than be OJ and deliver the lines. Yeah. And uh, in one scene, I'm trying to hide something from him because I'm, I'm fixing the Super Bowl and I got a bundle full of cash and I'm hiding it from him. And he sees me and I turn away and put it in my belt. Yeah. And he goes, what, what do you got there? And I walk away from him, and he, he starts following me around. <laughs> and I, wait, I make him follow me around in the sea. So it cut to the Peter Bottoms, the director came over and went, hey, you know, you, 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 you made him follow you. We're going to do another take, but you got him following you around. I said, yeah, he's not used to working for that money. <laughs> we started laughing. I did the same thing the second take, and he did the same thing. He followed me around trying to see what I'm hiding. And... Uh, 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 it, it, uh, it was a funny show. It's a shame. We, we, we should have done at least another year. That would have been great. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and then of course the whole, the whole trial of the century thing, that was, uh, yeah. that made it, yeah, it made it hard for people to look at you when you came into, into audition for a little while. <laughs> but, uh, oh, oh, you worked with OJ. Oh, well, what does that got to do with it? I mean, Jesus, you know. Uh, yeah.
and said, all right, I'm going to have to drink a little heavier here. So, um, yeah. uh, but that's the way it goes, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that would have been cool to have a football series and then a baseball series. That would have been great. Yeah. There's still probably one out there. There's probably still one out there I can nail, so it's all right. <laughs> So do you still, I mean, with the exception of COVID going on, do you still do stand-up? Yeah. Yeah, I did a, I did a lot of Zoom shows and stuff like that uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, I'm going to start booking my shows again soon. Uh, uh, I had to cancel a lot of them last year. I, I had a couple of one-nighters I was booking. One was in Hemet, and another one was uh, going to be set up out that way. And... Uh, I had some larger shows that I had to cancel also that were like in some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of these communities, um, 55 and over, they have amphitheaters. Yeah. They have Vegas showrooms. They have amazing stuff going on. And uh, I did one of them at uh, a place there, and they gave, it, gave me a great budget. I brought in Bruce Baby Man Bound. Yeah. Uh, and Bob Golub, who's famous from Goodfellas. I know Bob, yeah. Uh, it was a really, it was a great show. I mean, it, they, they loved it. And then boom, we have the pandemic. So, but uh, yeah, that and uh, getting back into voiceover and stuff like that. So definitely, uh, yeah, the pandemic was, was uh, I had been down with TFJ for about a year and a half. And then uh, 2019 was great. Then suddenly we had the pandemic and I'm stuck in the house again another year. But it, it, uh, yeah, I think it was. I think it was good for me mentally and and uh, uh, and actually physically to a good degree because uh, uh, I lost a lot of weight and I. Um, when you well, you got a lot of time on your hands, you can do a lot of thinking, and instead of using the time to be nervous and upset, I uh, I wrote and I uh, researched what I was working on and and I did all the things that uh, that uh, I normally would be distracted. So uh, that worked. It, it worked out pretty good, and um, you know now uh, I'm moving to another town mm -hmm. because I've looted everyone's apartment where I used to live. <laughs> so I'm out of there, and uh, <laughs> I am I am moving from the valley though. And somebody said to me, "Why are you moving from the valley?" I said, "Because as soon as I gave the address of my new place." My car insurance went down thirty-eight dollars a month. So that's, the, that's one reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so, good. Uh, that's good that you're still yeah. doing stand-up at least in the voiceover work. Uh, I I really think that you have so many good stories. You should write a book. I I'm working on that now. Uh, I have been working on a book. Um, uh, the, the the working title is Eskimo Pie is after me, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't I don't know if I can use the title because I don't know people are so, but it's a, it's got a lot to do with uh, uh, everything from uh, being the journey I've been on in this crazy career, and then also the weight loss up and down, the weighing and the overeating, and coming back, and yeah. and then getting depressed and blowing up again, and then. Do, coming back down and uh, uh, it's it's really amazing it's it's a really uh, uh, amazing stuff and I'm going to uh, I want to put it all in it because I think uh, it, it'll be good for it'll be good for people definitely because for people to see that uh, you know even if you are overweight or whatever uh, you can turn things around and, and, and I'm not a self-help guy believe me if I was a self-help guy I would have helped myself a long fucking time ago but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway I just um, it's one aspect in a book but uh, there's, uh, mostly what I'll be putting in there is, is obviously stories uh, about stand-up and, uh, and all of that stuff from when I was a kid there's a lot of crazy stuff too where I grew up that's good uh, in uh, in Newark, so uh, it's a really it was wild, and uh, yeah, and um, let me see what else is coming up. Do I have something coming up? I think yeah, I'll be doing my Twitch show again called uh, Retro uh, Gaming with uh, Devin and uh, friends. I I I can't remember the exact name because we haven't done it because we haven't had the uh, the, uh, 
what do you call it, the pandemic, so we haven't been doing it. Yeah. But we usually, we usually, uh, since I was there when all the new games came out back in the late 70s, I usually talk about it. We play a lot of the new video games. Yeah. And, uh, and people are fascinated because they're like, you know, oh, you were there when these first guys said, yeah, when I was in the, in down in La Jolla, when I would do the comedy store, there's a place called Midway, which is a, uh, an arcade. And they were the first arcade that I had ever been in where I saw video, uh, video, uh, uh, video games. Right. Put a corner in and these cartoons would fight and everything. And uh, it was fantastic. And uh, so those are the kind of games we play. A lot of the, uh, the old ones from back in the day. And uh, and it's a good show. We do comedy on it, and we do some music, and we have a good time. And uh, that's on Twitch. And then uh, I'm putting my website together, the Full Gainer, so hopefully that'll be up soon. And that'll be the name of my podcast. I don't know if I'll really call it a podcast as much as a rant, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> A rant cast is what I'm <laughs> <laughs> Oh, real quick, I wanted to ask you, uh, were you there the night that Sam pissed on Mark Maron's bed? Unfortunately, I was in a building. I was there. Uh, Todd, I, okay, Sam thought he pissed on Todd Lemish's bed. It turned out to be Maron's bed. Yeah. And uh, that was a night where Sam and I threw furniture out the window at Crest Hill. We were throwing yeah. chairs down the hill, but we, we didn't throw the table. That's also the night that Sam purportedly stabbed me with his scissors. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, what else happened that night? Um, uh, allegedly... Uh, Sam punched that Satanist, right? Huh? Pu- Sam punched that Satanist. Was Sam a Satanist? No, no, punch, no, Sam punched a Satanist, the guy who was like a drug yeah. dealer. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, some guy got punched, then there was a, uh, there was a guy that booked the comedy store that was there. Mm-hmm. Seiko was there. <laughs> the porn star. Yeah. And, uh, uh, let's see, the, the, all I remember, because I, I didn't leave till eight in the morning. Yeah. And. Um, I had never seen anything like this. Yeah, Sam's uh, ex-girlfriend, Tamayo, was asleep upstairs, so he kept blasting Highway to Hell yeah. on the stereo over and over and over. Uh, he, was, <laughs> he grabbed the guy that booked the comedy store, this guy George, and he was roughing him up. And, uh, and then uh, they, they made him stop. But, you know, shaking him and stuff like that. Yeah. And running around, he was running around screaming, and... Um, he kept saying to me, why don't you go beat this comic up? And I said, why? Oh, he dated a relative of yours. I said, yeah, but I wasn't there. I don't give a shit. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're nuts, man. You're out of your mind. And uh, it was Jack Daniels and Coke. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, uh, one of those nights. And, uh, yeah, he, he went into the bedroom, and I came up behind him, and I saw he was pissing on a bed. And I went, what are you doing? Yeah. Oh, fuck him, fuck him. And, uh, and I, I said, wow, man, Todd's going to be a little pissed off when he comes upstairs. But it wasn't Todd's, it was Mark's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because Marin, he fucking tells that story all the time, you know. And he, yeah. he doesn't, I don't think he knows about, you know, Sam pissing, wanting to piss on Todd's bed, you know. So, well, yeah. It's so funny because it was like Sam was. He was going to piss on somebody's bed. That was, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to piss on his bed, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, what do you do when you walk in and a man's pissing on a bed? You just, what? It was like, I don't, I don't, I couldn't, under, I thought I was hallucinating. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was nuts. It was so nuts. Yeah. And, uh, oh, man. But, you know, that's another reason why I, I hung around a lot. I, I dug hanging around and everything, but I, I know, uh, I don't think I would have been able to uh, put up with that kind of shit every day. Look, in the, in the movie, I am Sam Kennison. Yeah. Uh, I asked him flat out, because he was, uh, I'd see him in the middle of the day, and he would be dressed as Sam. He wouldn't be in a t-shirt and jeans hanging out. He'd be in the, Beret, you know, 
And I asked him straight out, I said, what do you, what do you like this all the fucking time? Because he was complaining about Emo Phillips. <laughs> oh, he's not the same guy off stage. I said, of course not. It's a character. Like, <laughs> yeah, I said, you, you walk around like this all the time? I said, what's the matter with you? And he thought you had to be that guy all the time. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I've met Emo too. He's he's a, a very nice, insightful guy, you know, off he's stage. A cool guy. Yeah. Is very cool. Yeah, I, I've never uh, met her, but uh, yeah. Well, Joey, I yeah, thank you. I thank you so yes. much for coming on today. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, well, I had a good time too. I enjoy doing these things because everybody has different questions and then I find different answers. I don't mean I make them up. It's like, oh, yeah. nobody ever asked me that. So, so uh, 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 it's great. And, and you're a great host. Uh, Thank you. I'm sending you a set of tires and some steaks. The meat's a little old. The tires are old. <laughs> but it's the gesture. It's the gesture. Well, it's, anyway. su it's summertime. I need barbecue. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Where I'm... Uh, I'm moving out from an apartment. I'm moving into a house now, and uh, yeah, and that's why I was over here uh, today and uh, barbecuing a grill outside meat. That's oh, uh, that's the summer. Oh yeah, that's the best thing in the summer, man. Is yeah, one I can't eat in the house. I can't cook in the house. It's crazy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to uh, turning on the fire and smelling the meat while it cooks. That's, I'm looking forward <laughs> to that, my man. Definitely. All right, Joey. Well, you be safe and, you know, get that book done, and I'll be looking for it. And I, you have. I really appreciate it, Tommy. Thank you so much. Really. My, my pleasure. I really appreciate it. And, yeah. you, and, um, and uh, listen, stay safe yourself, and, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, go to my Facebook, Joey Gaynor, you can friend me there, and whatever. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And keep you abreast. <laughs> hey, Tommy, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun, man. Yeah, have a great day. You too, brother. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Joey Gaynor. Ain't he a cool dude? Uh, what a funny, funny, insightful guy. And it was great to talk to him today. And I stand corrected. He's not a member of Sam's Outlaws. But he hung around that crew. So I apologize for the intro of saying that he was. Welp, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.